Many years ago, there was a perfume maker who made the best perfume. He had been working on his latest creation for well over a month, and his persistence was beginning to pay off. This was the best perfume that he had ever created. He couldn't wait to show it to the queen so that she would be pleased. In his hurry to go announce his latest discovery to the queen, he forgot to cover the perfume. And while he was away, flies were drawn to the sweet aroma, and some fell into the container, and they couldn't escape. Soon their bodies began to deteriorate, and soon they caused the perfume to stink. Can you imagine what the queen thought when she caught a whiff of the odor? You know, the moral of this story is to guard your fragrance well. Guard your fragrance well. This morning, fragrance is a metaphor for the church, and I certainly believe that is within the scope of our text. Solomon, in his writing, is talking about an individual or God's people. And this text speaks to us today because God's word was written for our benefit. Romans chapter 15, verse 4, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, may have hope. So our study of Ecclesiastes this morning brings us to Ecclesiastes chapter 10. Ecclesiastes chapter 10, we're going to cover the entire uh, chapter, so if you'd like to turn there, I'd like to share that with you. Ecclesiastes chapter 10, there's only 20 verses, so uh, 10, 1 through 20, reading from the word of our Lord. As did flies give perfume a bad smell, so a little folly outweighs wisdom and honor. The heart of the wise inclines to the right, but the heart of the fool to the left. Even as fools walk along the road, they lack sense and show everyone how stupid they are. If a ruler's anger rises against you, do not leave your post. Calmness can lay great offenses to rest. There's an evil I have seen under the sun, the sort of evil that arises from a ruler. Fools are put in many high positions, which the rich occupy the low ones. I have seen slaves on horseback while princes go on foot like slaves. Whoever digs a pit may fall into it. Whoever breaks through a wall may be bitten by a snake. Whoever quarries stones may be injured by them. Whoever splits logs may be endangered by them. If the ax is dull and its edge unsharpened, more strength is needed but skill will bring success. If a snake bites before it is charmed, the charmer receives no fee. Words from the mouth of the wise are gracious, but fools are consumed by their own lips. At at the beginning, their words are folly. At the end, they are wicked madness, and fools multiply words. No one knows what is coming. Who can tell someone else what will happen after them? The toil of fools wearies them. They do not know the way to town. Woe to the land whose king was a servant and whose princes feast in the morning. Blessed is the land whose king is of noble birth and whose princes eat at a proper time for strength and not for drunkenness. Through laziness the rafters sag because of idle hands the house leaks. A feast is made for laughter. Wine makes life merry, and money is the answer for everything. Do not revile the king even in your thoughts, or curse the rich in your bedroom, because a bird in the sky may carry your words, and a bird on the wing may report what you say. Won't you pray with me, please? Father God, we ask your blessing upon your word this morning, and Lord, that we pray that Uh, you would speak to us and that we would have hearts that would listen. And uh, Father, we just pray that uh, as we study, uh, that your word would just become 
uh, much a part of who we are, much a part of our lives. And uh, Father, that we may um, be in the likeness of Christ when we go out into this world to share your message with others. We pray it all in Christ's name. Amen. You know, after meditating once again on this passage, I want to admit right up front, in as much as I love the church, I've not always covered or protected her as well as I should. I've been good at times, and at times for various reasons, not so good. But my love for Christ and my love for the church, particularly Shelby Christian Church, has never, ever wavered. Any decision I have ever made in the 26 years I have served, Shelby, under very various well-respected elders, I have made with the best interest of Shelby Christian Church at heart and in mind. There have been challenges. I mean, the past several years, in the past, we've had average between 220 and 240 in attendance. We had one Sunday where 356 people came to worship, and it wasn't even Christmas or Easter. Go figure. But then we had COVID. We have had elder leadership changing two and three at a time, either retiring, moving closer to family, or, or changing employment. I mean, complete turnovers in leadership. We've had that a few times, and even so on our, on our praise team. Um, golly, I can remember several praise teams that we've had over the years, and many of uh, even late. Um, and by the way, a new church moving into town, making a dent in the other churches, uh, including ours. Uh, those kinds of events that have taken place, and others have brought with them new challenges for us as a church. You know, I'm pleased to say we have been meeting those challenges and overcoming. If you watch the attendance board each week, which hangs in the back of the room, uh, we've been averaging, oh, between 95 and 125 uh, since all these events that I've just mentioned, uh, depending on the Sunday. And I've often said, if we could get everyone that attends our church all to show up on a Sunday, we would have great numbers. But somehow, it's just difficult getting everyone here at the same time. There's just always so much going on. But the good news is, there are new people showing up just about every Sunday. And they may come one, two, or five at a time. Uh, but they come. And the greater percentage of them come again. So while we'd like to see, you know, phenomenal growth, slow growth is not so bad. That has been our trend over the years. And that is how we grew from 140 back in 1998 to the mid-200s on an average over the years. You know, the fact is, it is God who brings people to our church and into his kingdom. It is God that causes growth. And if you turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, right after the Gospels, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul's letter to the church of Corinth. <clears throat> Probably a, a passage that many of you are familiar with. Beginning in verse 6, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. Did you hear that? I mean, we have the responsibility to, to plant and to water, but God is the one who brings them in. God uses each one of us to reach out to people. So don't be too hard on yourself. Keep telling people about Jesus, keep telling them about your church, and let God bring on the numbers. But it's imperative that you keep on telling others. You know, the very first verse in, in, in our text this morning, uh, once again back in Ecclesiastes chapter 10, uh, which would be, of course, verse 1, uh, is dealing with flies in our perfume. Did you hear that as I read through it the first time? Solomon is addressing wisdom versus foolishness. 
The topic of foolishness is mentioned often by King Solomon in his writings, 93 times in the book of Proverbs, which he is the author of, and 32 times in the book of Ecclesiastes. King Solomon had wisdom given to him by God, we are told in 1 Kings chapter 3, and he wrote down wise ways of living in many areas and encourages all of us still to push away from foolishness. You know, as I have stated, King Solomon has mentioned foolishness many times. Uh, we have read through the book of Ecclesiastes. We've, we've witnessed that. Uh, we are in our 10th week of Ecclesiastes, and foolishness appears in several chapters. If you recall, if I go back to just, uh, for instance, Ecclesiastes chapter 2, uh, verse 14, the scripture says, the wise have ears, or I'm sorry, the wise have eyes in their heads. And you know, I often accuse my mom of having eyes in the back of her head. But the wise have eyes in their heads, while the fool walks in the darkness. While the fool walks in the darkness. So as he thinks about fools, the Solomon, he notes that foolish people do not tend to pay attention to the world around them. Wise people watch and learn. Wise people know how the world works because they see what happens around them. But a foolish person is just the opposite. A foolish person walks through life not watching and not learning and not using light that is available to him. The verses earlier in Ecclesiastes about foolishness are all part of the thought about foolishness even here in chapter 10. Today, our text begins talking about foolishness. It, it continues to talk about being a fool, and it ends talking all about foolishness. It feels like an exhaustive list of what foolishness is like. Verse 1, foolish people give in to foolish living, and their life stinks. Verse 2, a foolish person's heart leans towards the wrong direction. Verse 3, a fool is a fool and knows but doesn't care. Verses 4 through 7, anyone can be a fool from the lowest person to the highest person. Verse 8, a fool digs a hole they can't get out of. Also in verse 8, a fool breaks boundaries and gets hurt because the boundary was there for a reason. And then verses 9 through 11, a fool isn't careful or smart when doing dangerous things. Verses 12 through 14, verse 20, foolish people let their words get the best of them. And verse 15, it is foolish to work with no direction in mind. In verses 16 through 17, a fool is a childish and is childish in parties when there is work to be done. Verse 18, it just goes on and on. A foolish person is lazy. Verse 19, a foolish person thinks about money is the answer to everything. You know, I don't know about you, but I think that this chapter summarizes foolishness and folly. And foolishness, people, uh, foolish people pretty well. It wraps it all up. We may not be able to define foolishness exactly, but we sure know when we see it. And here in Ecclesiastes chapter 10, it explains it over and over and over with lots of examples. The acts of a fool are flies in the perfume. Over the years, I've, I've possibly had my times, although few, as the fly in the perfume, but again, only with the best interests of the church in mind. If I was stupid enough to be any different, the elders could have easily given me my walking papers at any time. Instead, I say very humbly, they always gave me commendations, praises, and raises. None of them asked for, but just given. You know, Victor Yap, he's a preacher in Hong Kong, and he tells a story about a man named Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones, who was driving past the state mental hospital when his left rear tire went flat, and while Mr. Jones is changing the tire, another car goes by running over the hubcap in which Mr. Jones was keeping his lug nuts. The nuts are all knocked into a nearby storm 
drain. And Mr. Jones is at a loss for what to do. He's about to call a cab when he hears a shout from the state mental hospital from behind the hospital fence where one of the inmates has been watching this whole thing. Hey, pal, why don't you just take one lug nut off each of the other three wheels? That'll hold you uh, and your tires on until you can get to a garage or something. And Mr. Jones, he, he's kind of startled by the patient's seemingly rationality, but he realizes the plan will work. That will actually work. And he installs a spare tire without incident. And before he leaves, he calls back to the patient. You know, that was pretty sharp thinking. Why do they have you in there? Why do they have you in there? To which the patient smiled and responded, I'm in here because I'm crazy, not because I'm stupid. You see, it often only takes something small to run something great. Our text says a large amount of perfume is ruined by a few dead flies. A lot of words out of the mouth of fools, that is, words without the wisdom of God, can spoil a whole lot. You know, you've heard it, one bad apple can spoil the whole bunch. Jesus said it this way, Matthew chapter 7, verse 15. Watch out for false teachers. They come to you dressed as if they were sheep, but on the inside they are hungry wolves, flies in the perfume. Unfortunately, you can get a small group of people who are being influenced by just one or two people, and they can become a pack of wolves in sheep clothing. And then you have all kinds of flies in the perfume creating a stench. You know, I believe that happens for various reasons. Usually the chief reason is self-promotion and narcissism. You know, everybody wants to be on top. Or as the psalmist puts it, thinking more highly of yourself than you should. You know, that can't be happening. That can be happening for a number of reasons, but we don't have time to get into those this morning. I only say just watch out for the wolves in sheep's clothing. Why? Because you might not recognize them. You just might not recognize them. If we look at uh, verses 2 and 4 where our text says uh, it is the difference between wisdom and, and being a fool, look with me back at uh, verse 2. The heart of the wise inclines to the right, but the heart of the fool to the left. Even as fools walk along the road, they lack sense and show everyone how stupid they are. If a ruler's anger rises against you, do not leave your post. Calmness can lay great offenses to rest. You know, I like verse 2 from Eugene Peterson's The Message Paraphrase, where he wrote, Wise thinking leads to right living, stupid thinking leads to wrong living. Fools on the road have no sense of direction. The way they walk tells a story. There goes the fool again. You know, it often takes far less to run something than it does to create it. Have you ever taken part or watched kids build a sand castle on the beach? I'm sure you have, many of you. They work so hard, sometimes all day shoveling sand into their sand bucket, meticulously crafting and building a, a huge sand castle. Unfortunately for them, high tide came in, and it only took a couple of waves to wipe out all of their work. Derek Kinder, in his commentary on the book of Ecclesiastes, puts it this way, it's easier to make a stink than it is to clean it up. You know, once again, this is another passage, chapter 10 from Ecclesiastes, that appears at first glance to consist of a number of unrelated thoughts. But as we continue our study and we look at the overall passage, we've discovered that there are, are some common themes that hold this passage together. And as I've mentioned, the primary theme is the idea that it is easier to make a stink than it is to clean up the mess. But cleaning up is not impossible. 
you know, with that main theme in mind, let me give you three observations that Pat Demania, in his message on the topic, listed about this passage that will help us to better understand. Number one, a little evil destroys so much good. The consequences of foolish actions are always far-reaching, and many others are affected. The second thing is we are often endangered by our own actions. Look with me at uh, verse 8 and 9 of our text, if you would. Whoever digs a pit may fall into it. Whoever breaks through a wall may be bitten by a snake. Whoever quarries stones may be injured by them. And whoever splits logs may be endangered by them. You know, what all these have in common is that the person that is engaging in these activities is endangered by his own actions. Perhaps these verses are a wake-up call for all of us, honestly, to take an honest evaluation of our own actions and see how we've endangered ourselves with those actions. We would do well to heed the words of the Apostle Paul as written in Romans chapter 12, verse 3. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith that God has given you. You know, we often do the most damage with our words. We're all familiar with the adage, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That is a lie that is straight from the devil. And every one of us has the battle scars to prove it. So it's not a surprise that Solomon spends so much time in this passage focusing on the importance of our words. Beginning in verse 12, if a snake, I'm sorry, words from the mouth of the wise are gracious, but fools are consumed by their own lips. At the beginning, their words are folly. At the end, they are wicked madness, and fools multiply words. No one knows what is coming. Who can tell someone else what will happen after them? Who can tell someone else what will happen after them? You know, even the references to serpents in this passage would have immediately been associated with the tongue by Solomon's readers who would have been very familiar with this psalm, Psalm 140 and 3. They make their tongues as sharp as a serpent's. The poison of vipers is on their lips. In his epistle, James writes about just how lethal of a weapon that our words can be. In James chapter 3, verses 5 through 8, The scripture says, Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. You know, once again, this is not just true in our individual lives, but it's also true in the body of Christ. You know, there's an old story about a donkey that found a lion skin left in the forest by a hunter. He dressed himself in it and amused himself by hiding in a thicket and rushing out suddenly at the animals who passed that way. And all the animals ran the moment that they, that they saw him. This donkey in lion skin. The donkey was so pleased to see the animals running away from him just as if he were King Lion himself that he could not keep from expressing his delight by a loud, harsh bray. <laughs> the fox who ran with, away with the rest 
He stopped short as soon as he heard this bray. Approaching the donkey, he said with a laugh, if you had kept your mouth shut, you might have frightened me as well. But you gave yourself away by opening your mouth. That fable told by Aesop in the 500s BC has a great message. It really is the same message said by famous American author Mark Twain. It's better to keep your mouth shut and appear stupid than open it and remove all doubt. You know, one critical comment or sarcastic remark at the wrong time can ruin an otherwise meaningful worship service, Bible study. A criticism directed publicly at a teacher can rob others of the benefit of that person's teaching. Although we often intentionally use our words to hurt others, we can do just as much damage with a careless word. In particular, there have been times I've said some things that I wish I could put back in the toothpaste tube. And maybe you find yourself in the same position this morning. And if that's the case, I don't want to leave you discouraged. So here's the good news. God is in the business of cleaning up our stink. Fortunately for us, Solomon, as he has done frequently throughout this book, doesn't just leave us with something negative. Even though we are often incapable of cleaning up our own stink, God is both willing and able to do that on our behalf if we'll simply let him. But he has only promised to do that for those who love him and who have committed their lives to him. So, if you're here this morning and you've never committed your life to Jesus and accepted him into your life as your Savior and your Lord, I want to encourage you to do that today. If you are here and you've already made that decision in your life, then let me leave you with this promise. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. The all things that Paul writes about in the verse certainly includes all the stinks that you have made in your life. And if you'll just turn them over to him, he'll help you work through them. But that doesn't mean that he'll do all the work. You know, perhaps you have to seek forgiveness for someone. Maybe you have to make restitution of some kind. It's likely that you'll have to make some changes in your life. Make that 180 degree turn. Do an about face. As our text says, turn to the right. If you're willing to do that, then God can complete the cleanup process no matter how big the mess is.